All right. Hello. Uh, welcome to Beginners Academy. Uh, we have talks for uh, beginners and returning hams in uh, amateur, amateur radio. And tonight we have a presentation, uh, Beginner's Guide <clears throat> for Remote Tuners. Um, my name is Greg. Uh, I'm N4KGL. So we'll, uh, we do have an audience uh, on, on Zoom here. And uh, we'll start with uh, the basics. Uh, what is a, an antenna tuner? Well, per Wikipedia, an antenna tuner is an electronic device in the feed line between the radio and the transmitter. And it's between a radio transmitter and its antenna. Its purpose is to optimize power transfer by matching the impedance of the radio to the impedance at the end of the feed line connecting the antenna to the transmitter. So to illustrate on the right, uh, uh, we have a radio. Um, uh, tuner is optional, so I guess it's in a dash box here, but imagine a tuner there, so the coax goes to the tuner. And then from the tuner, uh, the feed line in this case is going through a wall, uh, <laughs> uh, through uh, some lightning protection and onto an antenna. So if the impedance presented by the antenna uh, would not match the expected 50 ohms uh, uh, within a two to one SWR, uh, then you may, uh, well, you probably should use a tuner. Um, if your SWR is above two to one, most modern radios will start uh, dialing back the power. Uh, so uh, depending on your antenna, uh, it, may be very appropriate to use a antenna tuner. So do you really need an antenna <laughs> tuner? Well, what me worry, yeah. But <laughs> well, as we said, if your antenna does not present a reasonable impedance at the rig on the band you want to operate, um, a tuner can allow your rig to output power efficiently, uh, even if the antenna may not really be uh, resonant. So um, resonant antennas, we call them, uh, usually have an impedance uh, 50 to 75 ohms uh, that uh, would work well with your rig. And if you're just going to deal with resonant antennas, uh, maybe you don't require a tuner. Um, also, some antennas like a, a tri-band beam are multi-band without a tuner. So um, if people want to work uh, many bands with one antenna, you're really going to have a different impedance on uh, each band, generally, uh, unless there's some feature of the antenna hmm. that uh, 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 causes it to uh, work on multiple bands. So uh, non-resonant antennas, like a random wire, may be used on multiple bands uh, with an antenna tuner. And uh, uh, antenna tuners come in handy because uh, uh, some hams don't have uh, really the best uh, property for antennas and they have to come up with creative ideas. Uh, they might need to hide their antenna and um, uh, or put an antenna in the attic so in those situations, uh, a, uh, a 
tuner can come in handy. Um, also, uh, I've heard of tuners being used with mobile whip antennas in some cases. So do you need an antenna tuner? Not necessarily, but there can be a lot of situations where you may want to use one. So where might your antenna tuner be? Well, uh, if you buy, bought an ICOM uh, 7300 or many similar transceivers, um, it may come with an antenna tuner uh, built in. And, and this picture is a 7300 with the cover off. And on one side of the box on the top is the antenna tuner with... Um, uh, capacitors and inductors and many uh, relays. Um, the uh, range of tuners in rigs generally isn't all that wide, but uh, they they can be helpful. Uh, usually they work for three to one uh, SWR, but uh, sometimes it's uh, a wider range than that. Um, down at the bottom is a uh, LDG tuner box uh, that could sit on your shelf uh, next to your rig. <clears throat> um, um, and uh, that's an option. Uh, so uh, the uh, tuner next to your rig is convenient. But in other situations, you may want to use a remote tuner, which is our topic tonight. And we are going to discuss uh, the example we have here in this waterproof box is an ICOM AH4 tuner <clears throat> that's available from ICOM. Uh, so we'll be uh, covering some details on that. So. Uh, and um, even though uh, QRP rigs may be uh, very small, <laughs> uh, they may have a built-in tuner, built-in tuner even on those. <clears throat> so uh, what's better, the antenna tuner at the rig or remote? Well, uh, there's no standard answer to that. But there is uh, advantage to uh, remote tuners. Uh, one advantage is that if your antenna has a pretty high SWR, say on some bands, it has a very high SWR. It may, in other words, it's non-resonant and you have a tuner next to the transceiver, well, there's going to be a high uh, SWR on your feed line. Uh, so feed lines, uh, they have uh, what's called a matched loss. And generally, the fatter your coax, the lower that matched loss is. Uh, but coax will exhibit uh, what I can call an unmatched loss, additional loss due to there being a high SWR. And uh, it's not always a killer, so to speak, but you are losing some of your signal because of this uh, additional loss. Uh, if you have a very long feed line, that, that might be significant. So on the lower part of this diagram, uh, the ATU or antenna tuner unit has been moved uh, near the antenna and uh, the feed line, which may be long, goes back to the transceiver. Well, in this situation, um, uh, when the tuner tunes, uh, the the SWR on the feed line is going to be real close to one to one. 
And uh, so uh, unmatched, you really have a match situation. So uh, you won't have any significant unmatched loss in the coax. Uh, it does turn out that uh, the less loss in your coax to begin with, the less unmatched loss, but uh, that's kind of a nuance. Any uh, questions about uh, where the tuner could be? <laughs> so tuners that um, are designed to work uh, out near the antenna are called remote tuners, and that really is what we're going to focus on tonight. So what are some uh, popular remote tuners? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll start up at the top. Um, uh, this green looking tuner uh, to me is uh, SGC. Uh, that's a company that's been around a long time. Uh, and uh, uh, does uh, remote tuners. And um, in fact, the company's been around so long, I would double check that they're still around before you buy one. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I don't have any details on that, but uh, um, I'm not certain of the support, for example, for fixing them. So I would check that out. Of course, uh, if you get one at a good price, you may just want to use it anyway. Um, I've used uh, <clears throat> SGC tuners. Um, I've uh, also, I'll jump down the bottom. Uh, this white box here is an ICOM AH4, which has been around for many years. Um, and a benefit of the AH4 is that it's designed to work with ICOM radios. So it's a very seamless, integrated operation with a ICOM radio. Uh, and it will plug into almost all amateur <laughs> ICOM transceivers. Uh, except it won't directly, it won't plug into an ICOM 705. Uh, uh, I did get a cable off eBay that will let that happen, though. Uh, it didn't cost very much money. All right. Well, LDG uh, is a big uh, vendor for tuners in general, and they have. Um, a, a model, uh, I believe it's an RT-10, and that's in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and it's a waterproof box, as all these are, that can be located outside. And um, one convenient thing is that the power and control of the tuner can be done through the coax basically your feed line, uh, uh, you will need to use their box uh, with a little black box. So the little black box, uh, the coax comes into that. And on the other side, it leaves and goes to the tuner. Um, and there's a cable to plug it into uh, 12 volts. So uh, that's a very uh, nice feature. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, MFJ has similar things. So, uh, uh, but uh, 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 these seem to be uh, very popular, these three. Well, we'll hone in on the ICOM AH4. One of our Zoom members recently bought one. And uh, 
Uh, the AH4 is a wide range antenna tuner. So uh, it <clears throat> will be able to match mm. impedances of 10 to 5,000 ohms. And uh, it can be operated with radios up to 120 watts. Uh, somebody has a TV on, so you'll need to mute. <laughs> And um, so um, <clears throat> in the manual, uh, they don't cover uh, what we call doublet or loop antennas, uh, but uh, they do work well with the AH4. Uh, also, uh, the AH4 is in production, as far as I know. I saw it was available on HRO. <laughs> if everybody would uh, mute, particularly if you have a TV on, that would help us out. <laughs> so we're not covering all, uh, <clears throat> everything here. Uh, in fact, we're going to show examples of using this tuner. Um, uh, this is just the naked tuner itself. It's not really hooked up to anything. All right, well, uh, here's the specifications. Uh, it does do 80 through uh, six meters or 3.5 megahertz to 54 megahertz. Um, uh, that's with a 23-foot uh, antenna. Uh, uh, ICOM makes a mobile whip uh, that it will work with on uh, seven to six meters. Uh, we already mentioned 120 watts. Um, it will transform your antenna impedance to something close to 50 ohms. Um, now, um, it requires uh, 10 watts to tune. And if you're using it with a ICOM, which is designed to work with, uh, when you press the tuner button, uh, it will get the 10 watts to do the tuning. And uh, it does require DC power. Uh, that's the detail you'd have to take care of and uh, less than three pounds. And uh, it's a box that you could mount on the leg of a tower or on a post or whatever situation you may want. All right, so um, yeah, uh, I, I like it. I like ICOM rigs, so it's a great match for ICOM rigs. And uh, this is the front panel of the ICOM 7300. And on the left, the third button down is the tuner button. And um, uh, when you tap the button, it will start the tuning process. And then you'll get an indication that it's tuned on, on the uh, screen. Uh, it will also blink if it can't tune. So it's not absolutely guaranteed that everything will tune everywhere, but it will give it a try and it will let you know that it's tuned. So uh, uh, that's very nice. Uh, with the uh, SGC tuner, they also recommend using 10 watts to tune. But um, to get that um, with your radio, you might have to switch to CW or AM or something and, um, and push your push to talk, uh, let it tune then switch back to the mode that you wanted to use. So that's doable, uh, but it's a little bit inconvenient. And the ICOM, it's just a matter of pressing the button. Um, a lot of times there's a question, well, 
uh, how do I turn the internal tuner off? Well, when you plug in a, the ex, an external tuner, um, like the AH4, then it will automatically disable the internal tuner. So any question about using the AH4 with ICOMs? Yeah, you said that it wouldn't plug into the 705. Is, is it gonna, besides the SO239, has it got another plug involved? Like is there yeah, a, a uh, we're gonna, cable? Yeah, we're gonna see that uh, it has uh, um, a four conductor control line. Oh, so it's talking to the radio through a separate control line. Yeah, so. Yeah, and the ICOM 705 is about the only ICOM transceiver that doesn't have <laughs> the right plug. Now, uh, ICOM uh, will uh, entice you to get their uh, AH704, <laughs> which will plug into the 705. But I did find a workaround on uh, eBay uh, and uh, 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 very inexpensive, and uh, uh, it will let it work with a 705. Yeah, we're going to see more details about how to hook up a AH4 uh, as we go here. So <clears throat> let me be perfectly clear, okay, <laughs> that the AH4 is a different animal than your desktop tuner okay uh, it is a remote tuner um, but uh, it's not designed to connect to a coaxial feed line uh, it's really designed uh, to hook to directly to your wire antenna <laughs> um, uh, you may use it with twin lead or open wire line but but it's not a tuner that has a coax in and a coax out. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, it will eliminate a high SWR on the coax feeding the between the tuner and your radio, um, which is a big advantage. Um, but uh, it, it's not a desktop tuner, it's a remote tuner. So uh, I have a diagram coming up, but uh, there is the control cable I mentioned. Uh, uh, it comes with a control cable of 15 feet. Uh, so it will be something you'll have to, you will need to get a longer control cable if you want to remote it at 100 feet or 300 feet away from uh, your rig uh, out there in the backyard. Um, it's a four, it has a four pin tuner connector, which plugs in the back of almost all ICOM transceivers. And uh, I mentioned the distance. Um, um, I'll talk about uh, feeding the coax through the grommet in a moment. And uh, it's a good idea to put some ferrite beads at the tuner end of the coax as an RF choke. I, I don't think it actually recommends that in the manual, but uh, that's an easy thing to do. Um, Okay, well, this is an example being the ICOM 7300 and at the top where it says tuner socket, I call it a Molex connector, but it's a four pin and uh, that's the connection for an external tuner. Is that a proprietary connector then? Will Molex fit on that grid? Uh, it's not. It's not proprietary, so uh, you don't have to get it from ICOM. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we mentioned those control cables. You can buy them. They're usually pretty pricey, uh, but you can also uh, make your own. 
and you can find uh, these uh, uh, connectors or plugs uh, 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 that will fit the tuner socket. All right. So here's our uh, AH4 uh, hookup. This is from the manual. Um, we've got our rig on the left and um, you're go going to have your coaxial cable. Uh, you're putting the tuner <coughs> uh, at some remote location. Um, a little uh, detail that uh, bugs me is uh, it doesn't come with a pigtail, so to speak. And um, uh, what they expect you to do is uh, pull your coax through the grommet and solder connector on it. Well, I'm so lazy, uh, I don't like to do that. <laughs> but <clears throat> I did pull some trick. Uh, I actually took the grommet, sawed it in half, <laughs> and and got got a uh, a little short jumper through there. Uh, that's a detail. Uh, but uh, but when you get the tuner, it's not plug and play. Um, um, in regard to the feed line, you will have to pull your cable through the grommet and put a connector on the end. And the connector connects to uh, a, a connector within the tuner. All right. And then uh, the little black cable along the bottom is the control lines, I'll call it. And um, it does supply the power to the tuner. So uh, the power comes from your rig and the, the control signals and so forth uh, come from the rig. And it goes through a, another grommet. Um, so, you know, this is not all that hard to deal with. Um, there is a, uh, a ceramic insulator with a terminal at the top of the tuner. Uh, and that's where you'll hook up uh, your antenna, the radiator, so to speak. And there is a ground connection um, at the bottom of the tuner. And you're going to need to hook that to something. We'll talk about that more. Uh, generally, a counterpoise or a ground rod, uh, something. Uh, your antenna needs to work off of something, and that's what that connector is about. Um, so uh, that's um, how you would uh, hook up your uh, ICOM AH4. Uh, turns out there are just many configurations that you could use it in. Uh, and um, one is simply to have a, what I would really call a random length wire somewhat. Uh, 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 I've hooked maybe a 34 foot uh, wire uh, when I was, uh, uh, stop the truck and <laughs> put up a little uh, telescoping mast and uh, ran a uh, wire out to the mast and um, and then threw out a couple of counterpoise wire. Uh, uh, I've used uh, two 20 foot wires because that's what I had um, uh, as a counterpoise. Um, uh, probably the perfect counterpoise will be a quarter wave <laughs> wire uh, that's elevated, but you don't necessarily need the perfect counterpoise uh, for it to work. So um, 
this is essentially uh, NFED. Uh, it's not your NFED half wave antenna. And in fact, uh, the uh, manual says to avoid a half wave or multiple of a half wave for the bands you're going to operate because a half wave or multiple thereof will have a high impedance that the tuner will probably have difficulty tuning. So uh, this is just the first of uh, several configurations we'll talk about. Any questions about hooking up to an NFED or random wire? All right. Well, the manual does not talk about doublet antennas, but uh, I've used them over the years. Uh, they uh, look like a dipole, but they may not be at a resident length. Uh, they may be a, a, a little, uh, some, a bit shorter <laughs> uh, than the resident length would be. Um, uh, could be longer on some bands. Uh, it's basically what's uh, convenient, what you decide. So uh, the doublet um, can be fed with some kind of uh, twin lead, open wire line uh, down to your tuner. I'm not showing an AH4 here, but it would be uh, uh, <clears throat> where this tuner is located, and then you'd have your feed line over to your transceiver. Well, at times I've actually put the tuner at the top of the pole and just run the lines having no feed line. Uh, that worked. I've used it for field day and, uh, and that's an option. So you may have no feed line, uh, just your uh, two halves of your doublet. So uh, I've used uh, 50 foot for each leg of the doublet. So that's 100 feet overall. And uh, uh, that would work on uh, 80 meters, uh, 80 meters and up. And uh, so that would be an option. Uh, another option is uh, a loop, and uh, this is just one example of a loop. Uh, I think we would call it a delta loop. In this case, it's fed at the bottom uh, and the center of the bottom leg, and um, um, <clears throat> so the thing about uh, these kind of antennas that we just discussed before is you can probably use them on all the bands you're interested in. So you get this loop in the air, put your tuner in, and then uh, when you change bands, you, you uh, request the tuner to tune, it tunes and you're, you're on the air. And, um, I've uh, used this configuration with a hundred foot of wire total at just what was convenient for me. Uh, and it's worked fine. You can also um, have the tuner maybe on the ground and then run up uh, a twin lead balanced line uh, to uh, insulator uh, and uh, feed both sides of the loop. Um, this is just one <laughs> of uh, dozens of loops. You can also have loops that are horizontal. Um, and you may have a loop that has 500 feet of wire in it. So <laughs> uh, there's endless possibilities. Uh, I don't have any experience with this, but uh, uh, this tuner is used with uh, mobile antennas. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't have any experience with it. Um, ICOM has their own whip antenna called the AH2B. 
And um, I'm sure it's expensive, uh, but uh, it will put you in business. Uh, you could use some other type of whip. And on the right, they're showing um, uh, using a whip plus a wire. And that would, in general, uh, the longer your antenna, the more efficient it's going to be. And um, so uh, this vehicle's parked and um, it's extending the antenna. <clears throat> also, in this situation, uh, the antenna could work uh, for near vertical incident skywave because uh, you could get some high angle radiation out of it with just a mobile whip. Uh, there's a very little high angle radiation. So, so if you want to um, uh, contact stations that 200, 300 miles away, uh, you want to optimize for that, you may want to park and uh, add your long wire to it. Hey, Greg? Yes. I have that AH, the AHB2. And yeah. if you put uh, a 16 foot um, uh, line on the end of the whip and yeah. ele 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 elevate just like it is here on, on your diagram, okay, it, it'll do 80 meter. Yeah. Yeah, we'll let you uh, operate a low band, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, like uh, 80 meters. Yeah. So if you're interested in emergency communications and you need to get that rig on 80 meters, uh, yeah, Jim mentions that uh, that's the way to d convert your whip antenna to uh, work on a lower band. Um, <clears throat> I'm throwing up an example of a flagpole antenna. Uh, those frequently include a tuner. So you could put the tuner out where the flagpole is, right in front of your house. And you might want to hide the tuner in a rock or a bush. <laughs> and, but um, um, a tuner such as a AH4 could be used in that that situation. So keep it in mind. So <laughs> uh, there are endless antennas. You know, there's basic types, but uh, there's variations on all those types. But uh, so um, you're probably going to play with a lot of different antennas and uh, as always, uh, they say about antennas, higher is better. Just do the best you can. Uh, longer antennas generally better, but you don't have to go overboard. Um, so you can match to pretty much any wire in any shape, but the pattern of that antenna will depend on its shape and its height above ground. So, um, so based on what you want to do, um, uh, you would uh, consider the pattern of your antenna. Uh, generally, uh, most of us, we just take what we can get and uh, um, pretty much uh, any antenna is gonna get us some contacts. So um, um, pretty much uh, if it's long enough the, and you have some kind of counterpoise, AH4 is going to give you a match, but not always. If it doesn't give you a match, you might have to make your antenna a little longer. Uh, it may turn out to be a half wave on that band. So by changing the length, you can uh, uh, get away from the half wavelength. And we've said all this, <laughs> but if you prefer, 
you can use resonant antennas and skip this tuner business altogether. So it's not mandatory to have a tuner, but it's uh, convenient to get multiband operation. All right, well, we at the beginning, we talked about SGC tuners, LDG tuners. Um, I also have, it's not a remote tuner. It's uh, a desktop tuner. I do use it portable. Actually, I don't think it's sold anymore, but they have the equivalent of LDG IT 100. And just if you're an ICOM person, there are other tuners that will connect to that connector and will behave. <laughs> it will integrate very well with your ICOM rig. So, so you're not absolutely locked in to ICOM uh, tuners. Okay, I'm going to uh, talk about a example which. Um, I was really new to camping and I was headed for falling waters and all I knew was that it said the campsite would handle a 30 foot vehicle. So I didn't know the particulars of the website other than it was at least 30 feet long. So I decided to come up with a loop antenna that was 30 feet long. So over on the right, uh, this is not a real picture. <laughs> this is from a antenna simulation. But anyway, uh, it's a loop and uh, horizontally along the X axis here, uh, it's 30 feet. And uh, then uh, vertically, it's 20 feet. So you got 30 feet on the top and the bottom and 20 feet on both sides. And that uh, adds up to uh, that magic length uh, of uh, 100 feet, which is, it's pretty much arbitrary that I picked 100 feet. But, but anyway, so I call this uh, my field day loop. And uh, I had a friend um, uh, uh, use the uh, Easy Neck on it, and uh, it turns out it's an Invis antenna on uh, 40 meters. Um, on 20 meters, it has uh, 39 degree lobes, <laughs> which is not real low angle, kind of medium there, but on um, uh, the higher bands, uh, it, it radiates at a lower angle. So, you know, uh, that's perfectly fine for field day. And uh, I did uh, use an AH4 because this antenna will, the impedance of this antenna will vary wild, wildly <laughs> uh, based on what band you're on. So we'll get a picture of this antenna. Um, it's still difficult to see, but I got two orange poles, I think. At the ends, uh, they're 30 feet apart and they're telescoping fiberglass poles and uh, they're 30 feet high. And I have a pole in the middle uh, that's 30 feet. So, um, with a 30 foot hole height, I could put the antenna 10 feet up the bottom of it and go across and then go along the poles up to the top and then across the top, come back down the other side and uh, go back across, uh, in this case, to the middle. Um, so uh, the one thing that this did do was attract attention to my camping site, <laughs> but but I uh, I staked out these poles 
and uh, uh, pushed each one up and and I, I was in business. And the next picture will show, uh, I did use twin lead to come down from that 10 foot. Uh, I fed the loop in the center of the bottom leg. Uh, it comes down and one side of the um, uh, twin lead goes to the <clears throat> top of the tuner uh, where it has that uh, terminal. And the other leg goes to the bottom where it has the ground terminal, but uh, neither of these wires are ground and it doesn't matter which one you hook where. So, so basically a nice thing about this loop was no counterpoise was required. Um, so this idea was just born out of, I'm going camping on field day. Uh, and I want it to fit in. I want to make sure it fits in the the uh, campsite because I don't know if I can cheat and get out of, outside of the campsite. So uh, it did work. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, essentially an insulator at the top where the feed line splits out and goes to each side. Well, it's not the top. It's the bottom leg, which is... 10 feet up. So um, I use this antenna at field day. Um, uh, I guess it's a bit involved having three poles, <laughs> but um, I've taken it to other places. I took it to Shell Island and we used it there. Um, so it's one example of a field day antenna. Well, we focused on the AH4. Um, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, the uh, LDG uh, RT10. And <clears throat> well, it's different uh, because uh, in a number of respects, uh, uh, one thing, uh, we didn't need a separate control cable. Uh, because the power and control are, are, go through the coax. Um, on the right is the little box where the power is put in. And um, you would have a short jumper to your transceiver from this box. It does have a few buttons and an LED on it. And you will need to hook it to 12 volts to get that power. And um, so that's different than the ICOM. And so that's really a bit easier, I'll admit. Um, and also it's uh, input, the tuner's input and output is uh, designed for coax. Um, so that's interesting too. You could come out and um, you probably could feed all the antennas we've talked about with it. Uh, you could also come out and uh, uh, have a ballon, either one to one or four to one. So um, now, <clears throat> uh, basically, uh, what I found uh, is I actually don't recall if I have to. Re reduce the power to do the tuning. I don't think the instruction says that I have to. So basically you can start transmitting and the tuner will start tuning uh, automatically if the SWR uh, is not less than two to one. And after a few moments, it will be tuned. But be sure you note that uh, it's only good for 30 watts digital. So, <laughs> so it'll be bye bye tuner uh, if you run 100 watts on FTA. Um, so this is definitely one to look at. Um, I'll show an example of using it, and this 
it works on 160 meters. Uh, the AH4 doesn't. And I guess I'll I'll mention that ICOM. I don't know if the AH4 is going to be replaced, but they've come out with a new tuner that looks just like an AH almost. Well, conceptually, it's the same as the AH4, but uh, it covers 160 meters. And sadly, it's significantly more expensive than the AH4. So, so if you want 160 meters with ICOM, it's going to cost you. Uh, 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 the LDG tuner is very reasonably priced. So I'm going to show you how uh, I use it, uh, one way that I've used it. And in this case, it's a vertical. And on the left, um, I have, uh, it is something I purchased. It's a N6BT V-8 vertical. And um, uh, it has a, a vertical radiator. Uh, it is aluminum tubing that nests together uh, and you stretch it out and um, uh, there's little clamps on it. And uh, so it's something that can be packed away if you wish. Um, and then it has uh, uh, a horizontal element. Uh, it's not a quarter wavelength, so this is not exactly, is not a ground plane per se. Uh, it's similar to that. Uh, the uh, radials, if you want to call them that, are elevated and uh, they are, um, they're not, they're about 18 feet long each or maybe a little shorter. Okay, so if you look on the right, uh, you'll see that the horizontal part is insulated from the vertical. <laughs> and um, uh, well, it turned out that um, I had kind of mixed success with this antenna with tuners, but I read a comment uh, on Eham and uh, someone used a one-to-one -one ballon. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then use the tuner uh, after that. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, if it worked for them, I'll try it. So this is the LDG uh, tuner. Uh, coax from the transceiver goes in. Um, I've got a coax jumper that comes out of that tuner and goes to a one-to-one -one ballon that's probably a lot heftier than it needs to be. <laughs> it's a kilowatt ballon, uh, but I happen to have had it. Um, it's a one-to-one -one, and it has two terminals at the, part, at the top and one terminal goes to the vertical element, one goes to the horizontal. Well, it turns out it works. And uh, so this is one application I have for a remote tuner. You could try this with the AH4, maybe leave the ballon out. Um, you could use somebody else's tuner. But anyway, um, this was a good excuse to get a RT100. Uh, and uh, it, it does work. Um, I do, I have, uh, it, this is not permanent out in my yard and I have taken it to campsites and I used it for the Florida QSO party and uh, it really did a good job. And so <clears throat> uh, I can't recall if it will tune 80, it probably won't, but it tunes uh, 40 through 10. So I can jump to any of those bands, uh, let the tuner tune and, and operate. So that's just uh, 
uh, one configuration that I've got some experience with. Okay. So, gee, uh, in ham radio, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, what radio do you want to use? What antenna do you want to use? Do you need a desktop tuner? Do you need a remote tuner? Well, uh, um, the point is to have fun. So you're going to learn <laughs> as you go, but uh, you are the chief engineer of your station. So uh, you get to make the call on uh, on uh, how you want to configure your station, and and you may learn something and decide to try something else. And uh, I just have a happy Bob Heil here. <laughs> He's at his station. <laughs> so. Uh, so we've covered uh, uh, several remote tuners. Uh, we've uh, covered a half a different configurations and there can be uh, a dozen variations of all those configurations. So at this point, uh, do we have any comments, maybe experience with the remote tuners uh, that, uh, it, that our Zoom group wants to uh, share, uh, uh, please go ahead now. What do you say, guys? <laughs> hey, Greg. Yes, Jim. On the uh, on that triangle on that loop, uh, can you can you show the uh, when you on both ends of it? Do you, are you connecting both ends of those those twenty foot legs to the um, to the output, or, or does one? Well, now are you talking about? The loop? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. for a loop, one, one leg would go to uh, uh, that top terminal. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other leg would go to the terminal on the bottom that they call ground. The ground, okay. Yeah, and if I'm using twin lead, uh, you know, I'll... Um, I uh, take the little center sections out so I get enough slack that I can hit both places. Yeah. So. Yeah, delta loops are good antenna. Well, that's just that's just single line, right? That's not using the ladder line, is it? Well, actually, you um, you could. Uh, the ladder line is optional. As a fee. But the wire going around in the triangle is a single wire. Right. It's a single wire, right? Yeah, you could. You okay, could. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we could. You could use the ladder line as a, a as, yeah. as the feed line into the tuner. Yeah. Where you feed the delta loop determines whether it's a vertical or a horizontal polarization. It makes it pretty. Uh, yeah, that's a good point, Chris. Okay. Uh, um. So, uh, say we have this. Delta configuration, mm -hmm. and really, it could be flipped upside down. Yeah. Also, <laughs> With two trees, it's a beauty. Yeah, yeah. but uh, um, I think my example, uh, I fed it at the bottom in the middle, mm -hmm. and that gives me horizontal um, polarization. Okay, but. If I was interested in vertical and maybe lower angle radiation, I I could optionally uh, feed it at one of the corners. Actually, about a quarter wave up from one of the bottom corners gives you a perfect vertical, I think. Yeah. There's lots of stuff on the internet on delta loops. One right. Of them, uh, I once did two of them, uh, one smaller than the other as a director, fed the other one. <laughs> and I uh, had a, basically a beam, a fixed beam in one direction before I got my 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 Yagi up yeah. on the roof and stuff. And it was a very effective antenna. It is. Right side up, upside down, whatever you want to do. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well, Bob, I know that you're doing a slight... Uh, uh, I guess your tuner's in the house, is that right? 
Yeah, it's in yeah. the house, so I've probably got a lot of losses in the line. So I'm no. interested in them, but I'd also like to get something that can handle 100 watts or more of FT8. Right. Well, you know, I don't know. Uh, the AH4 is, quote, I'd have to study the manual. <laughs> I suspect that an AH4 could handle it. Okay, I'll check but, their uh, data sheet. But I can't swear to it. Uh, we know the LDG won't. And the SG definitely would. Well. That's, that's a good tuner. Yeah. 237. Yeah. Are they still in business, though? Well. Their website's uh, not well maintained. Well, that's the question. <laughs> so. Uh, um i i think you would uh there's a sgc and a tuner full forum so i'd probably go on go on there and and read some of the posts and i i think um uh, uh that their support is uh it seems to be waning or it may be hard to get in touch with them so so it's iffy. <laughs> yeah, I think 40 watts continuous I'm reading here. I thought it was more than that. Yeah, there. Um, yeah, now um, I know LDG used, and they may still have it. You may find it used. Uh, they had a 600 watt uh, remote tuner. Yeah, I saw that, but I yeah. don't see it, that it's made anymore. Yeah, it's I sent them a note not. and asked them if they were going to if they're going to make <laughs> yeah. any higher powered ones. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's a consideration, but um, I'm very pleased I have a lot of discontinued stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just if you have to get it fixed, uh, <laughs> it becomes an yeah. issue. Yeah. The sailboat I was on years and years ago had the. SG two thirty. Mm -hmm. That you know, you come across a used one of those that does eighty watts continuous, two hundred watts. Yeah. Uh, gee, I didn't mention marine applications. Yeah, it had seventy foot backstay on this boat. I think I told you guys the story <laughs> about it already. And wow, did it ever get out? And it had it right at the back of the boat, just under the deck, and uh, the stay was insulated. So a little wire came up and then came up above the insulator. So it was uh, the feed line was four feet or something like that. Um, and the tuner was out of the way underneath the deck and holy cow, it was just amazing what that thing would do. <laughs> All right, well, I wouldn't go out and get one of these antenna, I mean, tuners just, well, to get one, but you need to decide uh, if, uh, uh, you know, resonant antennas can meet your needs. In that case, you won't need a tuner. Um, I actually find operating portable. I've used tuners. <laughs> uh, it's, it is one way to go, but I have some resonant antennas. And uh, for example, the Magloop, uh, can be tuned to resonance with the uh, variable capacitor. And uh, so that's a no tuner system. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate everybody's attention and uh, comments. And uh, we'll wrap up this session. Uh, uh, we'll put this on YouTube. Uh, we've gotten quite a collection of uh, uh, talks on YouTube. and. Um, so uh, check it out. Uh, um, we're um, a lot of us are members of the Panama City, Florida uh, Club. Uh, we also have uh, participants from uh, the Wiregrass Amateur Club in Southeast Alabama. All right, so we'll say uh, 73s and um, catch you on the air. <laughs>